Okay, maybe we can wait a minute. People have started joining and then we can start. Today, this uh, counting of votes is also going on. So some of our people are posted there also for today's duty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, election results coming up. So people are busy. In... <laughs> yeah, I mean, half of our staff actually are gone for counting. <laughs> yeah, this used to be a state uh, observatory. So government still, you know, sort of... Uh, <laughs> forces us to join in those local activities, yeah. I think uh, we can start now. Uh, yeah. In the meantime, people will join. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So uh, as you all know that uh, we are having this celebration of uh, International Women's Day uh, in the form of various activities spread over uh, multiple days. And uh, on Monday and Tuesday, we have had uh, two activities in the form of short talks, then panel discussion. And today uh, we have a special seminar uh, for uh, celebrating International uh, Women's Day. So uh, the aim behind this celebration and these activities is uh, uh, to bring attention to uh, issues such as uh, gender equality, gender equity, diversity, inclusivity, and the aim is to progressively work towards uh, making the society free of bias and stereotypes and discrimination against women. And uh, the theme for uh, this year is, uh, you may have uh, seen on social media and at other places, that it's to break the bias. So uh, in this regard, we have this special seminar today. We have Professor Shubhati, uh, Shubhavati Goswami, I beg your pardon, uh, from uh, PRL. She will be delivering uh, the seminar, Women in Science, Breaking the Barriers. So before I invite her, I will uh, present a brief uh, introduction. Professor Goswami did her PhD from Calcutta University. And uh, she is at present the senior, uh, senior professor in the theoretical physics division at Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. She is internationally well-renowned neutrino physicist. She's a member of India-based Neutrino Observatory Collaboration. She has also received several awards, including the prestigious Humboldt Fellowship from Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Germany, P. Shield Memorial Lecture Award for Women Scientists from NASI, J.C. Bose National Fellowship of DST Serb, she is also an elected fellow of all the three science academies in India and the World Academy of Sciences. And the reason why uh, she, is, uh, she has been invited as a speaker that she takes very active interest in fostering gender diversity in Indian physics profession, as well as championing causes of women in general. She is currently the chair of the Gender in Physics Working Group of Indian Physics Association. She is also a member of the Inter-Academy Panel of Women in STEM in India since 2021. And she is also the chair of the Women's Cell and member of the Internals Complaint Committee at uh, PRL. So uh, with this, I invite uh, Professor Goswami to deliver the seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Am I full screen? Right? Yes, yes. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Yada, for that kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to give this um, seminar. So, uh, you know, first, I would like to wish all the participants a happy International Women's Day month. And uh, as Dr. Yadav mentioned, the, this year's uh, theme was Break the Bias. And this was from the International uh, Women's Day theme. And the UNESCO theme was Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow. And as, my, I, as I proceed with my talk, hopefully I will be already, you are ever, be able to think more that why such things are necessary. So I will start with a riddle. Uh, so this was that a man and his son were in a car accident. The man died on the way to the hospital, but the boy was rushed into surgery. The surgeon said, I can't operate for that's my son. How is it possible? So I'm sure you are able to guess the answer, but you know, for a moment, people are not able to uh, guess the answer. They this was done in BBC and then uh, all sort of uh, answers came that maybe it's the godson or something like that. But the answer is simple that the doctor is the mother. But uh, many times we are not able to think of that answer, which is what is known as unconscious bias. And it is that we tend to associate profession with gender. So if I call a nurse, then uh, we will always think of a woman. And if I call a doctor, we will always think of a man. And in fact, um, in this Harvard University has an implicit test, which uh, one can take and see that what bias in, uh, whether we have any bias or not. And in fact, you know, when I first time take this took this test, I got that I have a slight preference uh, for a uh, male with science. So although I think that I am quite, uh, aware, but I still got this result. In fact, uh, this year in PRL, we did this test online and about 90 people participated. And uh, we asked everyone to take this test as a self-awareness program. There are many bias tests and it's, uh, it's fun and it's interesting and it will make you think. So if you have time, you can take this test and see. So bias is uh, inclination or prejudice for or against one person or group. And sometimes it leads to unfair results and it can include many things like, you know, socioeconomic status, uh, abilities, culture, religion, ethnicity, and uh, what is uh, in Indian context caste and what is our focus today is gender. And this affects all of us have some bias or the other and it affects how we perceive things and our decision making. Now bias is uh, two types, explicit bias and implicit bias. In explicit bias, one is aware of the bias, it's expressed directly, so it's a consciously they are biased. And for instance, you know, some people have this kind of thing that women are not suitable for research. And uh, implicit bias is unaware of the bias, it is there in the subconscious. And uh, for instance, sometimes, you know, uh, women have heard that they are not suitable for project requiring heavy instrumentation. So that is some kind of a bias implicitly it's there in people's mind and unconscious bias is hidden like the bottom of an iceberg. So in social psychology, it's called an iceberg effect. So you can't see it, but it's like hidden in your mind. And this is the cartoon where, you know, presumably a man is talking to a either interviewing or talking to a colleague and in his mind he is thinking that you know this person is more suitable for uh, child uh, bearing or some such thing so apart from the international women's day we also have a international day for women and girls in science which is february 11 and uh, the question is why such special days are necessary so i will share some statistics because you know nothing speaks like the numbers and um, we can see that in India, like uh, this was a 2018 statistics and these statistics don't change drastically over years. 
So there is about 25% of women are in science faculty of various institutes. And women make up only 14% of the scientists, engineers, and research and development institutes in India, whereas the global average is about 28.4%. So there is the number, and this is some statistics that we collected on behalf of our gender group. Uh, for the international conference yes, is, it, is it changing my slides are changing uh, yes they are uh, the interruption was from someone else sorry about that okay oh, okay no problem so so this is a uh, data collected from you know different in departments and web pages and uh, we found that 40, this is physics specific, that 45% of the research scholars are uh, female, blue is female, 41% PDFs are female, but when we go to faculty level, it becomes uh, 16%. So when we go to faculty level, the number drastically reduces. This is a gender statistics of faculty members in astronomy. This was given to me by the working group in uh, WGGE in gender equity of uh, ASI. And you can see here some of the institutes where astronomy research is done, the gender fraction in blue. This is PRL in our main campus, no women in astronomy. USO is also under PRL. We have only one woman faculty member. This is Aries, here also you see. In everywhere, the number is low. Ayuka, I think, now has one uh, faculty member, one woman faculty member. So the number at faculty level is really low. If we go to awards and honors, this is the gender fraction in the Shanti Sharup Bhatnagar Award. And uh, you can see that in 2018, the first woman to get it was Professor Aditi Sen Day. Uh, this is the in 2018. And by that time, almost 100 Bhatnagar Awards in physics have been given to male. So this is the ratio here. And this is the gender fraction in physics in Indian academies of uh, Science says like, you know, 7%, 6%. So this is the roughly the number. So this was like 2021, we have collected this data. So you can see that these numbers are really low as we go towards a higher level. And if we check women in leadership roles, this is a very small sample. And we just collected from few of the physics institutes and we saw about 16%. This number was about 3% when we collected in 2017. So this number has increased, but of course, this is really a small sample one and one needs proper statistics. That is one of the things in the Indian context that we need a collective, collected effort uh, regarding the st uh, statistics. Because what we are doing from our group is we are just going to the annual report web page and collecting. And so this is the famous glass ceiling problem of social uh, uh, science that the women go up to certain level, but when it goes to, you know, director, dean, or, you know, um, uh, council members, there the women face a challenge and as if that part, they can see, but they cannot reach there, they cannot break. So in academia, um, the, this is, we see that in banking, foreign sectors, or some other private sectors, this is broken, but not in academia. Okay. So this is, of course, a global trend. For instance, if you see the uh, Nobel Prize, only four women have won Nobel Prize in physics between 1901 and 2021. In 1903, Marie Curie. In 1963, Maria Gopart Meyer for a nuclear shell uh, structure. Then 2018, Donna Strickland for uh, uh, generating uh, high intensity ultra short uh, optical pul pulses. And then in 2020, Andrea Gies for discovery of supermassive compact objects. So this is only four women who have got Nobel Prize in physics. And there are many women who, uh, who deserved the Nobel Prize, but who did not get it. Jocelyn Bell Barnell, who discovered Pulsar as a PhD student, but Nobel Prize was given to her supervisor, Anthony Wish and M. Ryle. Then CSU, who uh, experimentally verified parity violation, which was proposed by Lee and Young. But Lee and Young got Nobel Prize in 1947, but who did not get it? And without that experiment, it would not have been established. Then Vera Rubin uh, for dark matter, she also did not get it. 
and um, and I read that you know she was a guiding light for those who wish to have families and careers in astronomy. And as I will discuss, it's a really a pressing problem how to balance your family and career and go ahead with a career in physics. And also Lisa Meitner for nuclear fission, and the Nobel Prize was given to Otto Hahn. So it is important that we are aware of the history of gender bias in science and, uh, and we learn from there. And this problem that as we go to the top, the, there are very few women is called the leaky pipeline problem. So this is from a US site and uh, this is the married fathers and uh, you know their careers are going without much problem. Single women go, uh, till a certain level up to them and then the number falls. But when one comes to married mothers, then the number really falls and uh, goes down. So this is, the, this is a famous problem. And in the Indian context, as I have told you that the leak is not really due to low enrollment at the undergraduate, postgraduate or PhD level. There we have reached almost the 50% number, but there is a serious underrepresentation as one goes higher up. So you see that we had 45% in physics in our sample to 60% at the faculty level. If I consider other countries, then what happens is at the uh, PhD level itself, the number is low and it uh, stays like, uh, you know, in that range. But in India, it's a difficult, different problem that is because of the, you know, socio-economic uh, background, you know, the way the marriages uh, take place here. So all that go in, in uh, having a diffi uh, difficult, different uh, scenario. So what are the challenges in the India context, Indian context? So there are many, but, you know, you can sort of classify them. One is gender stereotyping. One is biases and discrimination, and one is balancing career and family. So gender stereotyping starts early from school level. Uh, I do not know now, but at least, you know, till when my daughter was doing her uh, studies, and she is about 25 now, uh, we always heard that girls are good in humanities and boys in science, and girls are hardworking. In fact, in my daughter's class, the girls were doing really good. They were very good in science. They would come and discuss with me and I know. And once I went to her school in a parent-teacher meeting and her principal said that we have to open humanities for, uh, for the girls, for 11, 12. They were discussing that, you know, after 10th, what they will do. And I wanted to tell her, but my daughter hold my hand. She knew that mommy is going to tell something now. And she held my hand because you cannot tell in a parent teacher meeting when the principal is saying something. But this is the kind of thought that we have gender stereotype thought. So girls may think that they are good in science because of hard work and not because of their abilities. And that percolates in later years leading to low confidence, imposter syndrome. And this is more common for girls in STEM because we think that we don't belong there. And in fact, I feel that it is not also good for boys because boys may be encouraged to think that they are good in science and mathematics because of their gender. And in later, their career choice can be affected. And you know, also it is not very much encouraged boys taking humanities because they are also, they, there will be very few. So they also feel that pressure. So it is not that only girls feel that pressure, even boys feel that pressure. So uh, one major problem is balancing career and family and onus is still on women. So uh, we know that in research, getting a permanent job takes time. There will be four or five years of PhD, but at least four years of PDF. And that interferes with the biological clock. And sometimes uh, women have to make a choice between marriage and career. Then even if you, uh, can, go, you can surmount that difficulty, uh, there will be a, a problem in getting a job in the same place as your spouse, which is known as the two-body problem. And in fact, you know, I also uh, went through that problem. Then in conventional Indian families, mother is the primary caregiver. So that gives extra burden to manage family and career. Then uh, there was lack of institutional crash facilities, but I think that is coming up now. 
there is conservative thinking of families you know in giving support to women in choosing their career maybe they, if they have to go abroad leaving the family in all these things there are also economic reasons for which they are not able to uh, you know prolong uh, this research period with a non permanent uh, job and then uh, there is also the issue of intersectionality which we should not forget which is women from marginalized section uh, suffer more there are additional challenges like biases and mis microaggressions i talked about biases i will discuss briefly what is microaggression and there is a general perception that women are not good in physics and there is a non serious approach towards long term career goals of women so which percolates into resistance in offering jobs to women like questions about marital status future plans it is very common for one uh, um, uh, women candidates you know i found myself in, in prl and uh, they say that okay we don't want to hire husband and wife together and when i am going to another institute they are always thinking that her husband is there whether she will come or not and i was asked this question informally so and i don't think that you know anyone asked that question to my husband so these are the kind of things which and i was really uh, you know i i i see that this kind of problem still exist and that's about you know 25 years so it is uh, still persists there is also some kind of a bias against spousal hiring and uh, also there are the issues of sexual harassment uh, in academia so those are the things which are additional challenges so <coughs> like you know these are the challenges you know you face when you are uh, trying to have a career in uh, science you know sometimes for women it is the survival for me i can say that you know my thing was that how to survive in physics and you know how to balance everything and still have a career and uh, where i am i have no had no plans for that it just happened of course there was lot of hard work and lot of determination needed for that but even when we are here there are kind of things which you face so for instance you know my office here is just near the lift and many new people coming to our floor would knock at my door and ask about this and that and this is when i joined prl i went to the departmental chair to request him to have a uh, board with room uh, numbers and names of people near the lift and he told me they must be thinking you are the secretary so he told it as a joke which somehow i didn't like you know why should people think that i am the i am not undermining the secretary but this stereotyping the gender roles you know women cannot be a scientist that kind of thought that's not good which we still hear sometimes and this list is long and you know it's a good thought exercise to list the gender stereotypical comments that you have faced so this is another example like this is uh, the invisible supervisor i went to uh, in prl we had to register our students to some university and uh, we went there that's uh, we went to udaipur actually and i went with my student and when the dean because the dean in udaipur he doesn't know me so when he entered there he asked me has asked my student where is your supervisor i was sitting there so this is a cartoon which my daughter uh, drew for me when i was giving this talk so this is uh, this is the sorry something got clicked so uh, this is the uh, kind of things that we hear and this microaggressions you know bias leads to microaggressions so like uh, questions like how did you become so good in math Uh, so this is like assigning intelligence based on gen gender then a most common question is are you sure you have been discriminated i can't believe it so this is denial of individual racism sexism heterosexism you are too kind this is often assumed about women colleagues so this is pathologizing working styles you know kindness may not be a bad thing in a given situation and i believe the most qualified person should get the job so this is the myth of meritocracy completely disregarding the background then female scientist mistaken for secretary which i experienced and asking a female employee if she is planning uh, on having children so these are you know this i uh, read in this book uh, microaggressions in everyday life and actually i was thinking that how many of these i have heard 
and you won't believe me i ticked all of them yes i have heard all of them and this is after i established myself as a uh, you know a physicist and i have got a job as a faculty member i am still hearing so i think we need to think about these things and so you know having these sessions is very important which will make us think about uh, these things and there are many more and uh, i have not uh, you know this is from cartoon from somewhere but what is important is that nevertheless she persisted so one has to pers persist and uh, this is my research group this is last year so these are my students and this is one of the parts of all this uh, you know struggle that you get to interact with young people and who will always you know renew your thought and um, and you know so that is one of the really a uh, good thing about being in research so what is the way forward first of all i think that one has to acknowledge that there is a problem because unless we acknowledge it the problem can never be addressed so one has to speak up if one faces a bias and uh, take proactive role to improve the environment around you through raising awareness here i have uh, listed some best practices uh, some of it are taken from this uh, un women organization uh, page but um, i will come about it you know our group also did some study i will come to it later so first of all addressing unconscious bias then society wise discussion supported by evidence based research and for which collecting statistics is very important in the indian context we need new frameworks especially to address the leak so like you know we call it a two body problem but this year in the last year we attended the international conference on women in physics where they called it a two body opportunity so we have to think that how to create two body opportunities and develop and prioritize in uh, raise the evaluation criteria in advance and judge all candidates in comparison to that criteria and know which factors are related to performance so you know family oriented questions should not uh, be important and assisting women through mentorship this is very important especially for young women then one has to foster women success in academia to encourage uh, young people then we need to see women in leadership roles and of course the trend in change trend is changing so there are many books which have come up so this is lilavati's daughter which all, of course came up uh, earlier around 2003 and uh, uh, by the indian academy of science by rohini godbole and ram ramaswamy and um, then later with mandakini dubey they also came to a girls guide to a life in science so lilavati's daughter has the biographical essays of several women scientists of india my essay is also there i am uh, very thankful to rohini for you know persisting with me to submit that and then there is a our independent initiatives like there is a uh, organization called um, life of science this is an independent media initiative they came out with a 31 fantastic adventures in science so 31 women stories of 31 women scientists written for children so there are many such initiatives also life of science uh, come up every year with calendars and in the calendar they have women scientists and you know from other uh, not only women like you know uh, from all as genders like transgender and you know even they have uh, people who are helping like the cleaners and the support staff so all that so this is very good and you know this has a much uh, greater reach to general people for instance when i appeared in the last year's calendar my mother was really really thrilled i never found her so thrilled with you know some other award or something because this really touched her to see her daughter in the calendar and uh, this is some toy which my daughter gave me this is really nice and you know this was uh, this is a puzzle where you have you know 50 women scientists and you when you, um, you when you make the puzzle then you come to know about the scientists and you know some of the scientists i mentioned like madam who they are all they also appear here so so this is what sally right uh, us astronaut said that young girls need to see role models in whatever career they may choose just so that they can picture themselves doing those jobs some days you can't be what you can't see which is very very true 
And so I will discuss some pioneers, women pioneers. And you know, uh, for instance, uh, these are the pioneers in computer science, like Ada Lovelace was also an actress, inventor of scientific computing, Heidi Lammer, inventor of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS. Grace Hopper wrote the first compiler. And this is the uh, top secret Rose is the world's first computer programmers. However, if you see in computer science also, it's not that the you know, women are even in, in fact, US, the number is really less, but women played such a pioneering role in this. And then we all have heard about Marie Curie, but what we uh, may not know is that in Institute for Radium Research in Vienna, 32 women scientists worked during 1920, 1934. And in Radium Institute Paris, about 47 women worked with Madame Curie, including Irene Curie. And uh, here I have uh, given the pictures of some few of them, like Harriet Brooks, who is the first Canadian nuclear physicist who discovered radon, then Ellen Gladish, who uh, was uh, uh, who worked uh, pioneering work on radium isotopes. He's the first radiochemist of Norway. Then Lisa Meitner for nuclear fusion. So. Uh, so I thought discuss some of the astronomers and there are, I see that there are many, many pioneers in astronomy. Hypatia, she is the first uh, astronomer we read about. She was a mathematician, astronomer, philo philosophy, uh, maybe because the movie came, people uh, may have know about her. There is Caroline Herschel, who is German astronomer, discovered several comets and Henrietta Leavitt. And you know, it's really her life story. Uh, it's really, really, you know, motivating and she discovered that you know how she struggled for the job and how she was uh, hired as a computer and in 1908 she discovered period luminosity relation of stars and she made major contribution to astronomy and i thought in uh, coming back to india i will talk about dr bibha choudhury who is the first woman high energy physicist in india she did path breaking work which contributed to discovery of pi mesons by powell uh, Powell won the Nobel Prize, but uh, so uh, Bibha Chaudhuri did it with D.M. Bose in Bose Institute and published five papers in Nature. But um, the thing is that it's not that uh, they said anywhere that they have discovered uh, Nobel uh, pions. So it was not that, you know, their name was never there in the Nobel citation. Uh, however, they did uh, path-breaking work and Powell later in a book uh, acknowledged their work. Uh, Viva Chaudhuri did her PhD in University of Manchester. After all this, after she did this work in Calcutta, she went to Manchester and she worked with Nobel laureate Blackett on cosmic ray air showers. She worked in TIFR just after her PhD. Then she came back, she went abroad again, and then she was in PRL from 1966 to 76 as a fellow. And then before that, as a CSIR research associate, uh, but we had, I have never heard of her. So that was until recently, I had never heard of her. So she remained completely obscure to future generation. No awards or accolades came to her way. It is only recently that, you know, a book was written, Jewel Anath by Rajinder Singh and uh, um, Shuprakash Roy. And uh, so then, you know, her work came to the forefront and uh, there were a lot of uh, things written about her, but uh, somehow she remained really in the sideline. And uh, she was uh, interviewed in Manchester Herald when she went to for her PhD in Manchester. And uh, she said that it is a tragedy that we have so few women physicists today. I can count the women physicists I know in India and England on the fingers of one hand. And the question that we asked is, has the situation changed? Of course, the situation has changed a lot. But as I have uh, showed that at the faculty level, the number, at least in, uh, you know, in most subjects and especially in physics, it remains really low. So it is still not a level playing field. And the question that we should ask is that, should we uh, apply the same yardsticks? And what is it seen is that, you know, it is not getting corrected with time. So one has to have interventions. So there are many initiatives from the um, government of India. So there was the women scientist scheme, which was started in 2002. And since 2014, all women scientist schemes 
have gone under the Kiran program of DST. And what was unique about this scheme was there was fellowships for women with a break. So that was one opportunity which was given to these women. Then there are also mobility schemes to help relocation of women scientists. There is childcare leave, of course, which is um, common to all field, not only in science. Of course, there are questions that whether these schemes should be gender neutral. And I feel that, you know, then it would help because for childcare leave, only women are able to take the leave. And then sometimes men may also want to support the, you know, family. And in that case, they cannot take the leave. And having that option also makes them take the leave. Very recently, the government of India has come up with this DST has ACRB has come up with this power fellowship and power grants for women scientists. <coughs> there is also the Gati program, uh, gender advancement through transforming institutions has started, which is an accreditation program in the line of Athena's one scheme in UK. So this is a pilot program under which they have some uh, number of institutes and a fixed number. And uh, they are uh, we going to do things to improve the gender diversity. And based on that, there will be some evaluation. And recently, the um, DST has uh, come out with a um, document, Science and Technology Innovation Policy, which is a very welcome document, which uh, efforts towards mainstreaming equity and inclusion. And it also specifically says about, you know, um, trans um, uh, giving opportunities to trans uh, people. So uh, it is uh, not yet implemented. It is at a proposal stage, but it is a very uh, welcome uh, document. So uh, there are also many gender equity groups. Uh, there are initiatives from academies. There is an inter-academy panel for STEM. Uh, and um, uh, also I told you about Dilabati's daughter and the other books and all the academies have panels and their initiatives. And there are two physics specific groups. One is the working group of gender equity, which was formed under uh, Astronomical Society of India in 2015. So uh, maybe may, many of you must be aware of this and this is their web page. And then uh, Gender in Physics Working Group under Indian Physics Association was formed in 2017. And I am part of this group and this is the web page of this group. So you can take a look. And uh, this is the activities of the gender, the WGGE. And this is a poster which was submitted to the International Conference on Women in Physics in 2021. So the survey that I presented to you for the Indian Institute Astronomical uh, Faculty in Astronomy was taken from them. They also did some other survey uh, like, you know, uh, regarding sexual harassment. So they say 22% women reported having faced sexual harassment, 38% reported knowing someone who faced sexual harassment, 83% women and 43% men perceived gender discrimination in academic institutions. So they did a lot of this kind of service. They also organized this Annamani lecture series, which is, uh, you know, bring diverse insights on gender equity. So this is given by uh, physicists, diversity experts, and, um, you know, journalists. So they arrange all these things to foster, uh, you know, to raise awareness about the gender based gender issues and from the from our group also we have we had it was formed in 2017 in 2017 we first organized one conference in which we discussed the issues of sexual harassment in in this our profession and that was, I believe, that is the first open discussion on this issue in a uh, platform that is uh, that was organized in ICTS, and the um, link is there. And uh, we, in uh, 2019, we held the first ever gender in physics conference in India, which was called Pressing for Progress 2019. And it was held in University of uh, Hyderabad, and you can see the participation from both men and women, and it was inspired by the International Conference of Women in Physics of IUPAC. 
So the deliberations in this conference came out in the form of a Hyderabad charter, which is a charter towards equity and inclusion for rectifying the gender parity violation in physics. And this is based on some fundamental principles that people of all genders have equal potential to excel in all aspects of uh, physics practice. And then uh, there are some best practices which were recommended. And uh, we took signatures from physicists towards the charter and more than 300 people have signed. And signing that charter means that you are committed to improve gender diversity in your immediate surrounding. So uh, it, it is there in our web page. So if you are interested, please do take a look. And uh, we are taking a signature from physicists, postdoctoral fellows uh, and faculties and uh, you, if you are uh, interested, then you can uh, send me an email or uh, send me a uh, mail. The way the ad email address is given in our web page for signing the charter. We also are organizing now a program for aspiring women scientists called PAUSE. This is an online program uh, to combat imposter syndrome, bias, microaggressions, and also discuss career opportunities and decision making. We have conducted three workshops so far. It is, it is held in a group of about 30 to 40. And um, this is some of that. So this is the designers are Deepachari from HB uh, SE and uh, Madhurima, V Madhurima. From, and some of the feedback is what I enjoyed the most is that we students get to share our experiences and opinion about several topics that have been troubling our minds. Being a shy person, mostly I started talking. So this is something we have started doing at a grassroots level. So I discussed about a lot of problems and, uh, but for the young people, I would like to say that a career in physics is still rewarding. And how you should go about is that you should believe in yourself, have a goal and work towards realizing it. Hurdles may be there, may need convincing people at your you know, social circuit in your family. But, uh, but you have to do that if you really like the subject, if you are interested in the subject, promote awareness around you, take inspiration from life stories of scientists, their struggles and how they succeeded, sought for mentorship. And there are several parts of a research career, despite all the odds. First of all, I feel one gets to do what one likes to do. There is freedom to learn, explore and discover new things. And uh, what really worked for me was that a sense of being part of something bigger and contribution to frontier of knowledge, because you know, at one point of time, I was thinking whether I would be able to continue or not. And but then I felt myself as a part of a bigger neutrino physics community. And I could not, you know, come out of that. And there is a sense of achievement while publishing papers and getting recognition, giving talks in conferences, national and international exposure, traveling to new places. There is flexible work hours that can, can be demanding since it is not a nine to five job. Pay is reasonably good now and many new places are having on-campus accommodation crashes, crashes, so it's better for managing family and work. So uh, I talked about role models and you know, there can, anyone can be your role model in your family, you can have role models. And uh, I just thought in the remaining two, three minutes, I will discuss some role models around us. And uh, so, uh, you know, this is Professor Rohini Godbole, we all know about her who pioneered, uh, the, he, he, she did pioneering work in standard model and beyond standard model physics at colliders and received the Padma Shri Award in 2019. She was the first chair of women in science panel of academy in sciences and she received the order national du Medite from French government uh, for her contribution for advancement in women in science. And I find, found a very nice book, which IIA has brought out last year, which is Women Astronomers of IIA. There are many, they have, you know, the, they have a collection of short biographical sketches of several uh, students, postdocs who were associated with IIA, but may not be in IIA now. And I have, I picked, picked out some of the senior people like Annapurni Subramaniam, who is the director now, GC Onupama, who was chair of GSI, president of GSI, then Moshumi Dikpati, who was my senior in college, and she is in USA now, and uh, she has done very good work, and then Projwal Shastri, uh, and she all, she was instrumental in some 
established in the working group uh, on uh, gender equity as well as the working uh, that uh, GIPW, the gender in physics working group of which I am a member. And uh, you know, this is the India based neutrino uh, observatory collaboration. I am a member of this collaboration. And there are so many women scientists, uh, D. Indumati Nita Sina from IMSC, then Sandhya Chobe, who is now in KTH Stockholm. Uh, she was earlier in HRI, and Vandana Nanan from TIFR. And these are the graduate students. And I end up program at 12 female and 13 male students who got their PhD. So you see, having so many. Uh, so many uh, faculty members in uh, women faculty members in I, you know, might have had uh, some encouraging effect. And these are the ISRO's women scientists uh, who worked in Mars mission Chandrayaan 2. This is Lalita Ambika, who she was in charge of Gaganayam, then Nandini Harinath, Momita Datta, Ritu Kariwal, TK Anuradha, Minal Rohit. Uh, then Vanita. So uh, these are, you know, they had done very much important contribution in all these missions of ISRO. So this is a really a feel good picture. So, so I will just end with this that, you know, a uh, scientist is someone who observes and wonders, listen to ideas of others, asks questions, conducts experiments, shares their ideas and discoveries, explores the world around them, uses tools to solve problems. So a scientist can be anyone, you know, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of background, and it's a, it's someone like you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goswami, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we have time for uh, some discussion. So if there are any questions, comments, you can uh, raise your hands or you can unmute yourself and ask uh, your question. Yeah, I do have some questions, but probably I will wait for some more younger people to initiate the discussion and then I will join. Yeah, let's make it a little interactive. I mean, uh, a lot of youngsters are there online, I see. So I think their uh, comments will be very useful. Yeah, Kalyani, could you unmute yourself and ask? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I don't really have a specific question, but I would just like to thank ma'am for her insightful talk. I really learned a lot. I took some screenshots and there were a lot of things I did not know about. I got to know about so many ladies and um, I was just wondering and I realized that there are so many people we did not even know about. Even some of the Nobel laureates I did not know about. So the world for sure is big. But if I do believe in myself and if I work upon it, I can also make it. Um, and like it's just um she, she was not a physicist but i remember mother teresa whom we all know but um she really inspires me to uh, work harder and just make my name in the bigger world thank you for uh, your beautiful explanation actually anyone can be a role model you know that is uh, that is very true like it can be uh, your mother your grandmother your aunt you know someone you know so that is there and you know it is not that uh, like um, uh, you know there are some research about textbooks if you see that uh, why we don't hear the names you know sometimes when i give talk to little uh, uh, younger people i will ask that how many women physicists you can name and people will only name Mary Curie because uh, and uh, you know i might uh, in university of hyderabad dr bindu bamba she did a research and you, you see textbooks physics textbooks, then there will be only picture of male scientists. So it's like that, you know, so that's why we won't know. And some of the things, you know, I also know when I come to give these talks. So I also learn from these talks. Of course, there may be male scientists also, we don't know, but uh, I think women, we know less, that is the thing. 
thank you kalyani for your uh, comment do we have any uh, other comment or question yeah um, hi dr uh, professor uh, this is anjali from ars i'm a postdoctoral researcher i don't know whether it's the platform to ask this question but i thought i should uh, the thing is that uh, most of the time when the applications are called for faculty positions you would see that um, reservations exist for uh, people belonging to bc sc st or all those categories personally i believe that if they can make it to the level of applying to the position of an assistant professor or associate professor it simply means that they are already brought to the mainstream do they still need to be in the reserved category so i mean women don't have any reservations or anything uh, uh, you know like uh, it is true like uh, what but you know what the research is showing and why these special categories are coming is because if one really takes the survey then there are very few people faculty members who are in that uh, from those categories uh, say for instance in iit i saw some data uh, from iits so the thing is that you know we are not aware of like uh, i come from calcutta i uh, did not feel any caste based discrimination or anything there but people do feel so it has not yet completely gone from india so so this special life came because there are there is very little research also very little data also on caste based research because you know my daughter was uh, attending a program in oxford and uh, she told me and and this was the topic of discussion that you know why there is very little data so i would say that i will come to a conclusion only when i see the data uh, so i am doing for the women only when i see the data yes people from these categories are have able to reach the level uh, then i will uh, i will be more comfortable in making a comment but from what i have heard is that and what few things i have seen is that there are it is not there in my this talk but i presented in one talk that at least one organization i know there are very few numbers so i feel that before coming to a decision we should see the statistics that is very very important and what you say will be very valid if the statistics shows that you know they have been able to able to procure jobs in these places yeah so what you know uh, you know when i was young also i was also i used to think that you know there when you know we are getting chance in engineering or something then uh, you know maybe we are not getting the field that we use uh, that we want but now after uh, studying about gender and all then what we realize i realize is that you know this uh, this is a there is a difference between equity and equality and uh, we are starting from a different level so people who are starting from a different level then uh, there should be some kind of a holistic approach towards that so this is true for women also i mean your point is valid maybe until uh, certain age groups i mean until they finish their graduate or undergraduate even entering phd but beyond that i'm actually wondering is it really necessary to have a reservation category for academic positions it's simply based on caste or religion i mean what's the point of incorporating religion into this fields if they are under privileged then there is a, there is but you are correct many already got the privilege so so i think we need to rethink for instance you know the Uh, what kind of under privilege they are coming from not just because of uh, as you say religion or some uh, ethnicity but um, uh, this is there you know world over that we need to take a holistic approach and because you know one needs to do, read that history that you know the uh, i i did not have much idea about it but when i am discussing with my daughter then i am having this 
uh, kind of um, realizations that maybe there is a necessity to think about it. And I would be really interested to see the statistics. And I know some people who are collecting the statistics and I have to present uh, uh, something in May uh, in an international conference. And for that, I want to collect the statistics. So maybe then I would be able to give you a better answer. Sure, thank you. So, you know, I will, I will be agreeing with you if there will be a certain percentage, like for women also, at least 15% are in the faculty level and we are saying. But if there is very few, like, you know, 2%, 3%, then we have to rethink. That way I am trying to see, say. But I am trying to do this research because of uh, my talk where I am asked specifically to present this in the context of Indian caste system. Great, thank you. It was a really nice talk. Thank you for raising this point. You know, we need to think about this point and I have been thinking about this point uh, a lot. And my thoughts I, are getting, you know, corrected sometimes or changed, I can say. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Anjali. Professor Banerjee? Yeah, thanks, Shribhavati, for a very uh, nice, uh, nice overview and also throwing some statistics, which is very important to conclude a lot of things. Let me start from this uh, slide itself. As you rightly pointed out, you know, uh, uh, equality and equity is different. In fact, uh, the gender equity uh, committee when we uh, formed in ASI was the secretary at that point of time. So this was also discussed. In this context, I was just mentioning and to be, uh, you know, probably uh, related with Anjali's thing, uh, age relaxation. You know, this is also a very important element. Sometimes you could straight away give it into the uh, job, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenario also, which is not given yet which is, I think, absolutely necessary because as you pointed out very correctly that there are uh, women takes the you know brunt uh, at least for a career break most of the time. Yes. Uh, whereas it is accounted for. So the society, I mean, the, our social system has to have that. And in the Western world, it is, uh, you know, uh, it is taken care of. But in our system, we are still not doing it. So this is, I think, a, a important, uh, you know, area. And I think, you know, I would request, uh, you know, particularly you uh, and your group to also uh, build the statistics more in terms of the, uh, you know, profile and age yes. profile also, where when they are uh, more matured for a, a, a professional application, uh, yeah. if there is a difference between, in a, a, you know, uh, this uh, two gender, uh, you know, applications. In that context also, I was uh, wondering this, I uh, discussed earlier as well, that mostly, you know, we are looking at the physics and astronomy, uh, you know, related uh, data. But how does this compare with the biological sciences? Because as you know, this is also quite alarming because uh, in biological sciences, there are a larger number of uh, proportion of students uh, from, uh, from a female gender. Whereas, as you pointed out, that when it comes to the faculty uh, positions and, and uh, getting up higher up, uh, you know, uh, uh, directorship or uh, you know recognitions and awards right. and all that exactly. that proportion is very much skew, you know skewed yes so, that is, that is so exactly how does it uh, compare i mean have you looked at I, the data i exactly i had seen you know both in biology and chemistry the numbers are better than physics hmm. but as you say i don't maybe it was um, in the 25 percent bracket or 30 percent i don't exactly remember now but uh, you know, this is very true that if you come to awards and all these, then it is not that high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel that this age relaxation thing that you say is very, very related. Like why we have so few Bhatnagars. And in fact, in the Hyderabad charter, when, where we have made a lot of recommendations, there is, a, there is a recommendation that the age limit should be removed. But what I have seen is that people are, you know, divided about it. And I think that it is really important. For instance, you know, many young women told me that, you know, ma'am, by the time young means I am saying 45 age group huh, as compared to me, so younger colleagues, they told that, ma'am, when we want to apply, say for Bhatnagar Award, the age limit is 45. Yeah. For many women, because of the, you know, children, childbearing, raising the children, they are not reaching their peak at 45. Right. So the point is that 
So it was discussed that now if I say that for only women give the age relaxation, then there are a lot of you know debates. But I said that okay, let us have the relaxation to forty-seven for all. Let men also you know compete. You know people will um, people will. Uh, Uh, raise issues like you know supposing if you say married mothers then people are not happy that married mothers should get some privilege but really married mothers are uh, taking lot of responsibilities uh, when you know i got married i had a child i did not expect anything from the system because i thought it's my personal problem but what i see is that realize it's not my personal problem everyone is facing that problem Yeah. So uh, when we discuss this, then sometimes people say that supposing I I am single, but I have to take care of my parent. But you know that is not a systemic problem. That's your personal problem. It is not that you know there are a lot of single people who have to take care of their parents. If there are, then we need to think about it. So this is a um, uh, this is a problem which is affecting many people. That's why we had this age limit relaxation recommendation there also and. Uh, we are also discussing we have a, in the gender group that whether for the award we can recommend this that you make it 47 why there are so few women who are getting bhatnagar and as you say across fields so it is very important point that you raised i didn't have uh, i didn't go into another slide where i had this leadership and another important point you know which i have missed is men as allies we need to involve men in all these things in the equip conference uh, it was in the equip conference it was um, it was a topic you know in the 2021 uh, international conference on women in physics men as allies was a topic of discussion so that is also one very important point we need men as allies because uh, you know otherwise we cannot solve this problem and yeah. this age limit thing as you say you know dipankar if you see director position ads then there will be some kind of a uh, experience which they ask for uh, which i did not meet because you know i had i changed uh, my organization i had a child so i um, i lost some time and i have only one child if people have two children it is impossible for them to meet that criteria so why for director position you know you have the same criteria for men and women because you know that kind of experience many times women may not get so that is very very important point and also you know when women change organizations then organizations should maintain their seniority which they don't my seniority was not maintained so you know i lost three and a half years which i earned at hri and there is it, again it is thought of a personal problem but it is not a personal problem many may face this problem right right it's a society which has to take care the system yes. has to take yes. care i mean and as you rightly pointed out i mean uh, charity begins at home so in you know uh, the two body problem for professionals uh, will be there and it could be same profession it could be different profession so that understanding uh, from the society at large is very important yes. so so that way as you said you know this awareness first of all you have to recognize that this is a, a, a yes. issue uh, unless you recognize that then the, you know you can't move uh, anywhere so mm. i think from the younger age uh, irrespective of any gender you know our students uh, i mean we have to all be aware that such issues will come when you when you grow and when you also uh, face uh, you know this kind of uh, Uh, issues when you get into a permanent positions and all that, uh, so that uh, awareness and accordingly uh, flexibility and all that should be there in the system and in individual as well. Uh, so to be honest, you know, Subhavati, I'm always very uh, you know take pride that I've been part of IIA for all these years, and yeah. to be honest, in yeah. IIA this has been uh, really nurtured yeah. uh, yes. from very yes. uh, very early. and yes. the, uh, uh, whether it is the student ratio postdoc ratio the faculty ratio yeah. always it has been decent you know as you know that, you know members leadership roles it's fantastic exactly really. i mean we have always uh, kept it uh, you know consistently any committees is co you know constituted uh, our positions are uh, you know uh, been shared and so on so uh, that awareness again has uh, brought me uh, to other uh, context and all that i this again a suggestion in your role model thing of isro there are two important uh, people actually you, sh you could uh, you know consider including dr sita who has been the pi of the astrosat 
Atrocity, yeah, yeah. yeah, and this Dr. was just Nita, a picture, you know. I got somewhere which I ah, ah, so I, I you know, sometimes yeah. you know, the Chandrayaan and Gangana, these are popular, you know, no, missions. No, yeah, so, you know, of course, we are really part of Astrosat. We have right. Santosh Vadavale, and I know, right, wow. right. So, uh, Sita is a good example, and now currently, uh, Dr. Nigar, she is the project ah, director yes, yes. of yeah. the Aditya mission. So yeah, I think they, I mean, you could highlight because they are, uh, I mean, of yeah, course, Sita yeah, just yeah. retired, but Nigar is very much uh, in the, and she will come into the limelight in coming uh, year or so. so yeah, thanks. Just... I found these pictures, so I copied, but I can always yeah, put their picture also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, there yeah. are many, you know, I, uh, there are, you know, if you go to slightly different fields, like, you know, in weather and all, there are many, many, which are also related to physics, but I could not put, I should, uh, in some other talk, I give a disclaimer that apologies to the women who. Yeah, of course, women. there will be uh, incompleteness. I mean, it cannot be always, you know, complete uh, in any uh, statistics. The other suggestion, if they are just using this platform uh, for youngsters and even uh, Virendra or Kuntal can look at it. You know, it's always good to also uh, bring the uh, alumni, uh, you know, page in terms of the male and female, uh, uh, you know, students and uh, their current status because why i'm pointing this out so we are also moving into a direction that uh, people may move into industry also i'm actually giving from yes. my own personal experience yes. as well yes. my wife was a you know brilliant scientist as well but she moved into I industry know. and she's doing exceptionally well mm -hmm. and it is uh, you know it's fascinating because she has gone to a, a, a industry or a, or a company where the md is <laughs> kiran Chamojumdar. so obviously she takes care of all her female uh, employees and and places them in the best uh, you know highest possible uh, scenarios so i think this statistics is also good but yes. because you know it could be for both the gender it's not that you know uh, I, we have it for prl actually because i didn't show it here but i collected the alumni statistics uh, some at least phd students Right, right. We had that data. So I will actually, because Virendra is also in charge of our knowledge resource center. So we have library, we call it a knowledge resource center, KRC. So we build the statistics and all that. So this is- Statistics is, you know, what happens is not readily available. When we are doing this, uh, right. presenting this poster, then we are asking, yeah, exactly. supposing in the web page, these all these diagrams, etc., are available. Yeah. Or in the annual report, exactly. Then, no, exactly. then yeah. it is very helpful for us to prepare these right, right. Uh, reports, and yeah. so we will. We should take up uh, this uh, task also. Yes, I, I will look into it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there are other questions coming up. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, Kuntalji, you are next. Uh, thank you for a very insightful and a very excellent uh, talk. My question is related to the mentoring program. So often we speak about mentoring the younger girls or uh, younger PhD students uh, who are females in their second or third year. But uh, would you agree that mentoring is not only required for female students as well as for male students? I completely, I agree. I completely agree with you, you know. But what I felt was when we were starting this workshop for imposter syndrome and all, then uh, this uh, question arose that, you know, whether we it should be like for both. But what I realized is that, you know, I think the problems are a little different and no one is addressing those problems of male students because, you know, as I showed the picture, uh, unfortunately, uh, all I did not have a female student and I have many male students. So I can see their problem, especially, you know, Kuntal, if, uh, and I can tell you about West Bengal, if they are West Bengal, there are two uh, categories, people who are coming from Calcutta and people who are coming from outside Calcutta. There is a vast difference. And I think they need a mentoring program. It's all, all these young boys. But I felt that the, it is little different, the need. And if people can design such programs, I am not an expert in that. It will be very good. In fact, this is what we exactly discussed that, you know, if such a program can be arranged for young boys also, then it will be very, very good because uh, we should do that. Yeah, my other question is also related to this only. So at an undergraduate level or master's level, there are several mentoring programs which are going on now. 
like in TIFR or uh, it yeah. also has some program now. But where we really require the mentorship is at the PhD stage about career guidance and how to balance their family as well as their research career. Yeah. So do you have any suggestions on how we could set up such a program? Because it's also a very demanding job. I mean, you need to really mentor them uh, in a good way so that they know what lies ahead. So what, you know, what, what I did was uh, that, uh, uh, what I can tell you what I did or what I do, First of all, in uh, my organization, uh, many people will come. The, as you said, the most uh, time, you know, the uh, problem they face is when they are uh, married and they are uh, planning a family. That is the time, you know, people are not sure how they will solve. There can be other problems also. So at an individual level, I do. I am quite active on Facebook uh, and many people ask me in Facebook personally send me message or send me mails also, but it is not being done in a organized way. It is a personal way. So we were also thinking that from the gender group, if we can start something and uh, we can, uh, we can, you know, I was a mentor for this Dr. Reddy's lab in, uh, in this, uh, Hyderabad, they had a mentor and mentee program and they had selected few mentors and then I am one of them and then they attached one girl but it was an undergraduate girl uh, level and to me they maybe attach more and then they gave the phone number and thing and they then that girl contacted me but and then I told them the same thing that and they selected these girls with some mechanism that they need some guidance as to, you know, because what will happen with this girl is suddenly one day she will call me or suddenly one day she will be send me, me a mail. And then after uh, six months, even if I try to contact her, she won't respond. So, you know, it is like a sudden, uh, sudden need and then they are calling. So I agree with you that, you know, we need to do it in an organized way and uh, one reason, maybe uh, one way we were thinking, maybe if we can make a panel and keep it in our web page and ask people that you can ask a question over email and then depending on the need, we can have a session or something. That is one thing which is although at a discussion stage with my other colleagues, but this is something we were thinking. Yeah, because in ASI and also WGG, we've been discussing about this. Yeah, yeah. Sustained uh, mentorship program at a higher education level. So I'll yeah. get in touch with you if you come, if you form ah, a sure, panel sure. like yeah. that. that because, you know, uh, Preeti program. is in our group also. Yeah. So we are also trying to coordinate. And uh, when you, if you come up also with something, then we will be happy. And also in the Hyderabad charter, we recommended that, you know, young faculty needs a mentor. Hmm. Because that also we recommend it. Have a mentorship program for young faculties. But uh, how to implement all these, that needs a larger uh, plan and as you say, time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kuntar ji. Uh, ji, you are next. And I would uh, request to keep it a bit short in the interest of time. We have already exceeded it. Uh, you are on mute. Indra Nil, you are on mute. I cannot hear you. Yeah. Uh, so nice talks, Rolvi. Uh, uh, my question is that, as you mentioned, that you uh, come from a relatively uh, privileged background in the sense that you really did not face many things that an ordinary, uh, you know, a, a person from an ordinary background would. So, and I presume that most of women scientists who have reached up to your level comes from roughly similar background. So what is the most prevalent, uh, what should I say, discrimination women face in general, maybe in some, you know, small little CSI lab and how is your organization of gender equity? I mean, does gender equity uh, committee has a fair idea about what is a general, most general uh, discrimination a woman face? And is there any 
you know, uh, I mean, once you identify a problem, there should be some idea about how to tackle that. Is there anything like that? So, you know, what we thought was that, first of all, we thought that, as you say, that, you know, uh, young girls who are coming from a small, uh, smaller areas, like I have heard my students here who are coming, they are saying, ma'am, each step is a struggle. So, first of all, we thought that, and, you know, then there, the self-confidence is not there because you are always hearing that the girls are not good for science and such things, no? So we organized this program, which I, I said that this uh, pause program and which are we are uh, organizing in, a, you know, like we organized it in Tezpur University, in IIT Ropar, in Central University, Tamil Nadu, so in, not in the you know, bigger organizations, but to the smaller. So that is at a level where, you know, you are, uh, you are able to tackle their problem from a young age. And this was largely based on the Vigyan Vidushi workshop, which TIFR organized. So that is one thing. Second thing is that, you know, I will say that even if you come from a privileged background, like uh, Indranil, up to PhD, I did not think anything. Uh, not even before PhD, MSc, it was all equal. After you come to PhD, the kind of discrimination that starts occurring, you know, like even we are clueless, like, we never even thought. So, for instance, if you tell, take me, it's a miracle I am sitting here and giving you this talk, you know. Uh, every stage, you know, when people say about awards and all, uh, I never aim for an excellence. I just aim to survive. So, that was like, I think, the worst problem that I think can say that even if you are good, you have no place. You know, the people are uh, so much... I like, I was told initially that you will never get a job in PRL. So I said that, let me first go to a stage where I can get a job in PRL. I have not even reached that stage. First, let me reach that stage. So that discrimination is, you know, and at each stage you face, like, you know, every time a committee will be formed and you will see that even if you are senior, you are ignored. It's not easy to go through that. So I can see that, you know, Glass ceiling is another problem and another problem they say in social science is sticky flow. That, you know, women who are uh, little in the lower rank, they just, just get stuck there. They won't. And I feel a dialogue with social scientists is very, very important because, you know, when I am started reading, reading the social science books and articles, I am, try, I am able to understand these problems much more. So glass ceiling, we are all talking about, you know, from where I come from, where I have reached, I talk about glass ceiling, but there is a sticky floor problem, which many women are suffering from. And it's also, you know, related to the economics. So it's a vast field. And I think that from the group, that's why we also want that uh, in the Hyderabad charter, we had a session where social scientists talked about it. So that is world over, this is realized that a uh, intersection of this with the social scientists is very, very important to actually understand the problem and solve it from a social angle. Okay, I don't see any other hand uh, raised. If there is any quick uh, comment or question, I request you to immediately do it. Okay, in that case, uh, we would uh, conclude here. I again thank uh, Professor Goswami for uh, joining us for this seminar, for uh, delivering this seminar, which uh, threw important, uh, threw light on important points, particularly uh, which will be useful for uh, the young uh, researchers and uh, research scholars and postdoctoral fellows who are present in the audience as well as uh, to uh, other scientists as well to you know become aware of uh, the existing issues that uh, women face so uh, with this uh, i don't see anything in the chat either so uh, we'll conclude here uh, thank you everyone uh, in the audience for joining us for today's uh, special seminar and uh, thank you again professor Guzman. Thank you very much, you know, from each talk, 
I learned something. So thank you very much for having me with you. Close the room now. Thank you, Professor Goswami, for uh, delivering this talk. It was very enlightening. And there were some school students also actually present because I had forwarded it to some teachers. So the first question you got was from a school student. I think that oh, I heard, uh, heard by looking at some of the women role models and the women physicists. So that was really nice. So I kept the talk at a higher level because I thought that it is for what I hope. But these are not very uh, junior students, perhaps from 9 to 12. I thought because it's a general talk, they will get, a, get an overview and a flavor of uh, what a career in physics is all about. So I'm glad that some of them joined. Nice. I am also very glad. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Javed, uh, please stop the streaming and close the room.